because it seemed to fit better right now. And but I did the same thing. I just asked people to share sort of what led you to this church to tell me the, that story and then what are your hopes for the future about um, where you hope our church will go. One of the questions I often ask is what is our church known for and what do you want our church to be known for? And so we would go at it that way. Um, so I put together a PowerPoint just with some of the summary of what I initially heard from everyone. And then um, we'll get into more about the 20 year scenario. So we are um, a group of people with diverse denominational backgrounds. I was kind of surprised, not totally, but how many of us came from different church backgrounds. And it was a wide variety of experiences that I think adds to the life of our church. We're a group of people who have found a church home at First Church of Christ for a lot of different reasons. Um, we're from Longmeadow and from surrounding towns. I started joking that people would come up to me and be like, I, I live in Enfield or I live in, you know, <laughs> I live in East Longmeadow. And I, it just struck me that while we're maybe more of a regional church than we realize, and I also think as the church, churches continue to close around us, that we're likely to become a more, even more regional church. Um, it used to be everyone in town went to church, right? Some of you can attest to this, and you did in the hope groups. And we're living in a new age and a new day where all of a sudden it's not so much about um, getting the whole community here as much as connecting with people over a long period of time in a lot of different ways. And so I kind of saw that um, emerging as well. Um, we're intergenerational, uh, which means we have people from all different age groups in our church. We are open and affirming. One famous quote from a critic of our denominational approach said that that church will welcome anyone in here. <laughs> That was a good one from Kenny's, somebody in his life. But, but the beauty of it is that I think we own that and we like it. We like that about ourselves. Um, we value our heritage, but we want to embrace the future. We are not a museum, but an alive and active con congregation and community. Um, so one person shared in the midst of a group, I used to think of your, this church as a museum until I became a part of it. Um, so what we want to be known for, being active and alive, not just surviving as a church, but thriving as a church, being progressive and inclusive, being both open and affirming and intergenerational, um, being diverse body and a unified around our mission, being cooperative and collaborative on an ecumenical and interfaith level. So the more we can connect, not just with our community, but also with the faith communities within our community. So the top priorities I heard were growing larger. Uh, almost inevitably, the whole group started with uh, more people. And then second w was more young people and the, the desire to have more families and children and so forth. So growing larger, growing closer, being a close-knit community is important to a lot of people. The sense of community, of being known, of having relationships was all very important. Should I be standing somewhere else? Or? No, okay. Um, growing warmer. So continuing to develop that side of ourselves relationally, growing deeper, um, getting to know God and each other better, growing clearer. I think about our identity as a church, the things that we value, 
what we hope will happen, and growing wider, meaning reaching out to a broader group of people. Um, clear strengths that I think we identified in the midst of these groups were a strong sense of fellowship and care for each other within the church, um, ongoing commitment to children, youth, and family ministries, um, our congregational embrace of the open and affirming position. You can vote to be open and affirming and not really embrace it, and it feels to me like our church has embraced it and continues to seek to embrace it further. Our desire for justice and social action, our desire for faith and significant spiritual experiences. Hmm? Oh, and music ministry. Oh, I might add, did I forget to print that? Our strong music ministry and the value of those who participate in it and feel a part of it is a big thing too. Um, potential strategies. Oh, that's not it. I guess I didn't make a slide for this one. But or, I might have just, I wanted to introduce everybody to our staff because I don't think we always see everyone. Um, so Jill Levante is our administrator in the office. Daniel, we all know. Am I, am I like, where do you want me? Is this better, here? I think I meant to stand over here. Let me try that for a while, okay. Thank you. It's actually my left, oh, no. I, um, so Jill is our office administrator, so you might talk to her on the phone um, more than see her in person, but if you're here on a regular basis, you see her in person. Daniel, you see every Sunday. Uh, Marilyn Paul Lewis is uh, our family ministries coordinator. She's here now and uh, presented the children's moment this morning in the spotlight. Stan, the man. We all know Stan, and, and what an amazing gift he is to our church. It's funny, there have just been a couple of Sundays when he's not here, and it's like, ah, you know. <laughs> um, Noelia is a great new addition to our team. She's here as well. I, I got to tell you, having to hire somebody new in that position was a high anxiety point for me early on in my time here, but grateful for how she's just jumped in and is doing an amazing job. Um, and then our church school teachers, including Alex, who's in charge of our nursery, Elaine, who teaches our lower elementary school, and then Carolyn, who teaches the upper elementary school. And I uh, also, Winona's filling in on the higher, yep, I'm gonna get to the, we also have assistants, Alex and Kathy. Am I missing anyone? Who else is an assistant? And Max, too. Yep, yep. So uh, we have a great group of people upstairs, and they consistently nurture our children and students. Um, our soloists are John, Sue, Carrie, and Mark. And they really help lead the choir, but also provide music in the summer, which was just awesome and great. What a gift each one of them is. Um, so potential strategies. Uh, one thing is maintaining stability. And ever since I came here, everybody's like, you're staying, right? You're not leaving. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, one of the strategies is to provide some stability and, and uh, I keep saying to people, I look at this whole thing as a marathon, not a sprint. I don't, the way I'm wired, I'm not a, yeah. So another big thing is building trust and doing things in trustworthy ways together. Um, becoming more humble, uh, more ministries and social action that community can share in. This is an important one that I think emerged in our conversations, which is it might be more likely to get somebody from the community to participate in social action 
than it would necessarily to take a first step into worship. Right? So finding creative ways to include the community, even in things like what we're doing with collecting things for people for Haiti right now, but on a broader scale, I'm going to get into that in a little bit, but I think the more we include opportunities for others to join us in mission um, might, might be a broader way to reach out to people and include them in the life of the church um, as well. So things worth holding on to. This, these are just things I heard in the midst of the Hope Groups. The Christmas Fair, Sacred Circles and our Bible Study, Spirit Speaks, Friday Evening Fellowship, Family ministry events, chancel choir, bell choir, children's ministries, music ministries, the Christmas pageant, the silver cross at confirmation, um, hospitality, the 12 step groups in our church, outdoor services, the tanglewood events, tree lighting on the green, Christmas lights in the church windows. So these are all things that people expressed as value points to them within the church and just sounded like things to hold on to. Too often in the church, and this is where I think a lot of clergy get into trouble, is they think that it's about winning victories. In other words, I think we should be doing it this way, and if I get you enough of us to agree to it, we win the victory. But whenever you're winning the victory, you're, you got winners and losers, and it, it's not as exciting. I believe that we develop momentum when we move from celebration to celebration, not victory to victory. Does that make sense? That doesn't mean we're not going to ever disagree with each other or that I'm going to, or we're going to have something to decide on. That will happen. But more importantly in the life of the church, when you go from celebration to celebration, in other words, you're experiencing good things in the life of the church, and you move from one thing to celebrate to the next, it builds momentum, it builds enthusiasm, and it helps the church to keep moving forward. And most of the things we do in the life of the church are worth celebrating. And sometimes it's simply about acknowledging what those things are and moving forward. Um, so strategies, I broke that down the strategies for growing into categories, growing larger. I think inviting people from the community to participate in social action, like I just said. Inviting people to share their testimonies um, and stories uh, in the life of the church. Festive meals for the community was one thing that came up in our hope groups. So, for example, a meal, we're talking about a meal for um, Mardi Gras before Lent begins, that kind of thing. Embrace a more regional identity. Um, so expanding our minds and just realizing that our church is becoming more regional in nature. I think that's going to help us to grow and help us to thrive into the future. Embrace events geared toward um, young children. We saw that this summer with the kids camp and what a great start that was and turnout. So we think those things are important. So strategies for growing closer. We talked about potluck suppers, dinner groups. We talked about starting a singles group, which Maryland is actually doing. Uh, so that's exciting. A May breakfast. And again, the Mardi Gras meal got mentioned. The May breakfast? That's, that's a good one. Is that an old one? Yeah. There was also a Chris breakfast with Santa. We're also talking about those are a couple ideas that came up. Yeah, I think we might be bringing that back too. So maybe you can be on that committee. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I mean, sort of. You got to be careful what you say around me, you know what I mean? <laughs> so strategies for growing deeper um, include spiritual formation classes for all ages, questioning uh, Christianity light. So this got brought up that sometimes people look at our inclusivity and say, oh, that's, they just take, they don't take their faith that seriously. And I think 
The opposite is true. If you take your faith seriously, you're going to be more inclusive and loving. And so it's kind of understanding the difference between uh, Christianity light and really maximizing our faith. So taking our faith seriously does not lead to fundamentalism. And it's one of the mistakes sometimes we play with in our mind. Oh, if I take my faith seriously, I'm going to become a fundamentalist. No. If you take ser your faith seriously, you're going to live a more radically uh, inclusive life. So Bible study is where we teach people to read the Bible seriously, but not literally. So sometimes it's not just knowing about reading the Bible, but also how to read it and how to approach it in a way that it brings life, not um, disruption. Uh, you know, one of the things I'm going to be doing, and I haven't shared this yet, is the confirmation material I've been developing for our 8th and ninth graders, I'm going to teach to adults. So it's called uh, Confirming Mystery, Not Certainty. And I haven't quite figured out how to, it might be adults, they'll do it once a month over a two-year period instead of twice every other week like I'm doing with the confirmants. So it'll be a different pace, but I'll figure out how to do that with you. And that's going to start the 22nd of October, something like that. So strategies for growing clearer. Um, just engagement with the UCC Association Conference and denominational settings. Uh, engagement with our open and affirming position. Um, I've been working a lot with the seven pillars of progressive Christianity, Conf the confirmation program, uh, honoring our heritage without denying our future, and our focus on environmental justice and social justice. So strategies for growing wider, participation in ecumenical and interfaith groups. One example of how we've done it in the past is the environmental justice program last spring was tr a tremendous interfaith event. It brought people together from various traditions and that was one good example. So community outreach. I think a parenting group in our church where parents are able to support each other while their kids are young especially. People struggling to heat their homes might be a way to reach out. Addressing food insecurity is one of the big things that's been revealed to me in Western Massachusetts, how deep a need that is. Um, somebody mentioned uh, Falaka, am I saying it right? Friends in Long Meadow uh, Community Action. So family outreach opportunities and bring back a carol walk from between the churches. Just an idea that came out. Um, So growing wider, I think I just did that, right? So I, this slide says multidimensional growth. So momentum develops through multidimensional growth. Finding a balance between change and stability is also crucial. So momentum needs enough change and enough stability uh, to thrive. Too much change or too much stability kills momentum. Sometimes when I teach on this, I draw two circles that are overlapping, and you put change in one circle and stability in another. And momentum is a place where those two things overlap. So if you have enough change, we're trying new things and experimenting with new things, and enough stability, it creates the environment in which momentum can emerge. Do you hear what I'm saying? Too much change. Like if we're doing everything new and never doing anything stable, it starts to lose. If you let go of those things that people really value in the life of the church that they want to keep around, you can kill momentum either way by introducing too much change or too much stability. In other words, if you always stay the same, it's not going to be joy-filled either. Some significant questions that emerged were, um, should we start a singles ministry? Should we focus on improving our facility? And should we bring back breakfast with Santa? Oh yeah, there it is. <laughs> so that was like the serious and not so serious, but um, 
The first one, should we bring back a singles ministry, is something that we've actually started addressing through our staff, and that's exciting. Uh, should we develop a significant focus on improving our facilities? This was related to people's interest in our capital campaign and the possibility of doing a serious renovation of our building. And I think, so, so my hope is, especially in the next 20 years, that that will be taken care of and taken care of well. Um, and then I think bringing back breakfast with Santa is a no-brainer in my mind. <laughs> But I understand the Christmas Fair Committee has to get behind it. I don't know. We'll talk to Ann later. But apparently they liked it. <laughs> oh, Shriners. Yeah, we don't want to compete. But we, we'll see what... So, I can see Stan and Ann now, it's going to be awesome. So the 20 year scenario, what is it? Uh, a 20 year scenario is a picture, you look out 20 years from now, you say, if our church started functioning the way we want it to function, what would our church like, look like 20 years from now? Where does it come from? It comes from us. The reason I spent all that time listening in our hope groups is to find out what do we want? What are we hoping for? What are we longing for? Why 20 years? Some of you have given me some great responses, like you're wondering what 20, you know, why 20 years? Basically because it doesn't threaten anyone. <laughs> if you cast a vision that far out, people are like, 20 years? I don't know if I'll still be living here. Or I <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, all of a sudden, it's like not a big threat. You can do whatever you want 20 years from now. Who cares? <laughs> and what are we waiting for? What always happens whenever I share a 20-year scenario is people go, do we really have to wait to do that? <laughs> no. We can start whenever we want. Actually, a lot of what I've been talking about, we've already started on. Um, when my wife and I had, we were expecting our second child, we had a firstborn in the house. I'm a secondborn, so I can say this kindly. No, um, firstborns tend to get really taken care of in a way, a special way, right? Where they're used to be in the center of attention and, right? So we were like, how are we going to help Katie? to make room in her heart for this new member of our family. And so I, she was only three, so I colored a picture with her. Isn't that fun? So it included the baby. Why did I do this? I was doing it to help her to know that there was a future she was going to be a part of and live into. And she had to sort of, in her mind and heart, make room for her little sister who was coming along. And that's been a work in progress ever since. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite pictures of our church since I came here, and it was Pentecost Sunday, and a whole bunch of us ended up up front waving banners. It's not the best picture because we took a snapshot off of the live stream, but it's still... Um, it's a fun picture. So we're not a museum. I think this is important because people can look at our historical stature in the community and think about it as this historic building. One of the reasons during the fall festival we opened our doors and during Pride Day we opened our doors was to say, hey, we're a living, vital church. And people went inside to look at the building like it was a museum. But we put those posters in front of them of all the active ministry, family ministry, children's ministry, youth ministry, uh, ONA, environmental justice, social justice, the Haiti Project. All these things were in front of them when they came to visit our church to say, and we were screaming it, we're not a museum. 
We're an active, vital church that you can come and be a part of. One of my favorite quotes uh, came out, our, our leadership team was in a meeting on discovering our church why. And in the midst of it, the UCC teachers said that one of the phrases the church, the denomination's using to talk about our why is that we're striving to be a church the world needs today. And those words rang so true with me, I put it on our church brochure. Um, and I think those are words to live into, striving to be a church the world needs today. Um, so humbly speaking, this vision I have for our congregation is when I think about what the church will look like um, 20 years from now. So 20 years from now, I envision our church growing. I can see our church being 350 to 450 people. That if we keep reaching out and keep reaching the community, slowly but surely over the next 20 years, there's no reason we can't be a thriving church with a lot of kids in our youth ministries and in our church school programs. Um, I kind of envision this hall being renovated and updated. I think the historical stature of our building is really important on the outside. I think we are a part of the historic community of Longmeadow and it's important to, to uh, not only honor that, to, but to maybe lead in that. And that's where I think taking care of our church building is a really important part of our journey together. Um, but it's simply to be respectful of the place we hold within the community of Longmeadow. But inside, we can do pretty much whatever we want because it's, it's an alive place. This room is awesome. The purpose and, and flexibility of the room for youth ministry is fantastic. So I can see us continuing to develop um, Bailey Hall in new ways and, and in ways that fit with ministry as we move into the future. So we take um, the church seriously, uh, but it's also the importance of our faith and sharing our faith with others uh, is important as well. Um, I think open and affirming is important, not just for our church members and not just, especially not just for our gay, lesbian, and transgender church participants and members, but for the whole community. I had one family uh, that goes to our church come up to me at the Pride Festival and say to me, before we had kids, we decided we wanted to be a part of a church that was open and affirming. So this isn't a response to something that happened now, it was a response to what they wanted for their family and their future. And so I honestly believe that this approach to ministry is important for keeping families together and also helping families to see the future in a different light. That they can be a part of a church and be committed to inclusion and and inclusion no matter how things turn out within the life of their families. It's, I think it's a combination. And that's why I said it's both intergenerational and open and affirming. Those two things go together in a powerful and profound way. And I think, um, to me, this is an exciting part of my participation in these next 20 years. Um, I, it's funny, when I did the seven pillars initially, right when I got here, people wanted to ask me questions, and I had that initial meeting where I said, ask me whatever you want. And, um, I just kind of did that. And then when I first got here, I was like, okay, this is new. I feel a new kind of freedom here in comparison with my previous denomination. But I need to describe what it is I'm so excited about. And the seven pillars of progressive Christianity are sort of a mix of things that I had grown to value and also that I wanted to emphasize as we move into the future together. The response was fascinating. So I taught two classes, one on a Sunday afternoon and one on a Wednesday night. And there were like 45 people at the first session and I didn't think anyone was coming to the second session, but they did. It was like 35 people. 
And at the end of both sessions, when I described the seven pillars, there was an ovation, like people clapped. When you teach, you don't always get clapped for. <laughs> and I remember leaning over to Kaylee, and I'm like, what is this? Why is there so much energy in the room? And she said to me, she goes, she goes, it's like you're naming something we've been working at for a really long time. And I thought that was kind of interesting, yeah. But then somebody else said to me, you should use this in your confirmation program or teach it to the kids. And I was like, hmm. And that sat with me. And then when I started, okay, I'm leaving a program. This will scare the eighth and ninth graders. In my old church, I taught confirmation once a week for two years straight. So if you were in seventh and eighth grade, it was very comprehensive. Almost too comprehensive. Like it was kind of, I bored myself sometimes. <laughs> so I came in and I was excited. I'm like, okay, this is a little more streamlined and, and I can just kind of pick out sort of my favorite lessons to teach. And, and uh, as I did that, I took the seven pillars and I said, do these fit? And then I'm like, oh, these two go here and these two go here and these two go. And it fit like a glove. So it was almost serendipitous that the way it framed out, that it all kind of fit together. Um, and I noticed in the UCC, they hadn't put a new curriculum together for confirmation since the 1980s. And a lot of churches were using a curriculum that was produced outside the UCC. So I'm like, I think it's time to write something new or to prep something new that, that fits. Um, and so that's, I'm excited about it, not only for us, but I, I've already had other UCC pastors ask me to use some of the materials. So I think it could be a fun project and that's why I'm teaching it to adults and students. The other piece is simplifying church structure. Um, one of the ways I got into the UCC was through consulting churches, and one of the big things I do is I help them to simplify their church structure. A lot of UCC churches were much bigger, and now they're smaller, and they're trying to figure out how to function. They can't keep up with their bylaws, is what they tell me. So um, I don't know what that means for us yet, and I'm still learning, and I we do so much good in so many different directions that I don't want to get in the way of any of that. But a on a long-term scale, I see hope. I, I, I think the theme of having fewer meetings and more ministry is a good thing for any church to focus on. And we'll kind of figure that out as we go. Um, so I see us being simpler, though, in some ways. Community outreach. I honestly think something central for us in this realm where we can connect the people in our community to outreach as a first step into our church is a great strategy long term. So what I envision, and a number of UCC churches are doing something similar, is having a day once a month where we collect food, non-perishable food for the food pantries and the soup kitchens around the region to help with um, food insecurity. So I envision like on a Saturday morning, once a month between nine and noon or something like that, where cars are lined up even more than for Montessori school during the week. <laughs> right? And they're coming to bring things to folks with boxes or bins or carts or whatever we figure out to donate those things so that we can help with food security all over western Massachusetts. Um, I kind of have this sense that maybe each month we could plan something else too, like this month we're going to collect shoes for kids. And maybe heading into December we're collecting coats for the homeless. Or hats for whatever. I mean, so we each each month we could hand out a flyer of what the additional item's gonna be next month. 
but where we're saying, hey, we think there's need in our community to reach out broad in broader ways, but we want the whole community to be a part of it. And First Church is sort of centrally uh, facilitating the effort. And, and people are finding a connection with the church in a new way um, through this. I've already talked about confirming mystery, not certainty, so that's the confirmation material. And I just think there's hope with using that as a way of continuing to encourage other UCC churches to thrive as well. Um, the Meeting House Lecture Series is something that has emerged partly from the good work that EJT did last spring and the event we had here, which I said was very interfaith in nature. And then partly what adult education has been doing this summer, heading into the fall, and the program that we have on October 18th with Philip Gorski. So the first meeting I went to with adult ed, they said, hey, let's do a speaker on this subject of white Christian nationalism. And I'm like, great. And one of our members was reading the book, The Flag and the Cross. And there's another book called Jesus and John Wayne. Uh, the author of Jesus and John Wayne lives in Michigan, but Philip Gorski was a professor at Yale. So I'm like, well, maybe we could get the author of the book. And so we just emailed Philip Gorski and he agreed to come and he's gonna be here on the 18th. But then there was this thing about the meeting house that people liked that name. So we decided to call it the Meeting House Lecture Series. And his fee was cut in half. One of the things about a lecture series is you need a little money to do it. And it wasn't exactly in our budget. So a bunch of us decided we would just give $100 each toward the lecture series and get it started. And then we'll do a free will offering at the event itself. And we hope it'll continue to fund itself in that way. But the Meeting House Lecture Series is an opportunity for us to invite the community in. We saw it at Long Meadow Festival and we saw it at the Pride Day that the community's excited about this opportunity as well. Yep. It kind of depends on the author. Philip Gorski did give us permission to uh, record it or live stream it, so I think it will be, that one will be. So it's just gonna depend on each one of the events. Um, but our hope is it's a long-term thing with a fall program and a winter program, or a spring program done by EJT. So one will be environmental justice and one social justice probably is the format. And if we decide to add another one, we can still call it a part of the series. Um, Before I get to music ministries, I envision us growing in unique ways. Uh, my wife and I were talking about this last night. A lot of people in mainline churches seem to be saying, well, people just aren't going to church anymore. And parents aren't bringing their kids to church anymore. And it's almost like we're gonna just throw in the towel and say it's just not happening. And I think we need to believe that we can be an exception to what's currently going on. Last Sunday, and I think it might have been related to the fact that Pride was out on the green and we were celebrating, and the topic of my sermon was pronouns matter. We had two eighth grade students come to worship on their own without their parents. Their parents drove them to church and dropped them off, right? And here's the thing. A lot of parents in my generation and beyond said this to themselves. Well, I'm going to make sure I take care of my kids, give them an education, but I'm going to let them figure out religion on their own. I think we might be in a place as a society where we need to take them up on that offer and expect that the kids are gonna come before the parents. And when the kids come and figure it out on their own, I think the parents will follow. 
So I think one of our primary things over the next 20 years needs to be a high commitment to youth ministry and family ministries like we already have, but we need to continue to expand it and to see it grow. We're in the process of hiring our part-time youth worker again, so that's in progress. But I, my long-term hope over the next 20 years is that that will eventually become a full-time position and that we'll have so much need in the area of youth ministry that um, that, that, that position um, will grow. So I see our music ministries continuing to thrive and I also see us becoming more diverse and more unified as a church. So I see our music becoming more eclectic as we go. I think Daniel's awesome. And <laughs> so already, I mean, I see the fruit of having him and his vision in the, in the music ministries and I, I continue to see that growing and expanding and including children and youth in the midst of what we're doing as well. Um, so I think we're going to grow one person at a time. This is probably my favorite picture uh, so far. And it was the day I baptized Bailey. Um, and from day one, when I got to the church, they were like, Bailey needs to get baptized. COVID got in the way. She's a little older. Is that okay? And I'm like, absolutely. And what a joy. Um, but you don't grow. It, I've even had some people apologize to me like, man, if people knew how good things were right now, this place would be packed, you know, that kind of thing. And I'm like, we're going to grow. It's like, that's why I say it's a marathon, not a sprint. I don't expect to come in any Sunday and have droves of people like come in, you know. Like, <laughs> what I expect is slowly but surely we're going to connect with people through our ministries. And that over the next 20 years, if we keep doing that, it's going to keep growing. And so combining stability with change and just continuing to embrace what we're doing and doing it in deeper ways um, will lead to great results. I had one other meeting and it was with the small groups in our church. And I realized, and I had kept hearing about sacred circles and I had no idea exactly what they were. So I was kind of curious, like what do you guys do in, in these groups? And it's not even all that complicated. As a matter of fact, there was a time in my life, I think if somebody said, can you design a really effective small group ministry? I think I would have designed the sacred circles, the way they meet. They meet and just check in with each other. They reflect on one theme and they pray. But I looked around the room at the people who were participating in these groups and a lot of them are the people who are leaders in our church today. And I thought that might not be an accident. So I think expanding the idea of small groups, of gathering together for different reasons, we need to include the men in it. Um, and uh, figure out ways to make sure we're taking care of the deep fellowship needs that we all have. Because it's obvious to me that that has had a positive impact on the life of our church. And I just see it as something to expand as we continue to grow together as well. Um, does anyone have any questions? I've been just rattling on a little bit. Growing our humility? I, I just think... Um, She asked about my comment about growing in humility as a strategy for growth. And I think for me, it's about, do you remember last Sunday in the children's message, I had two kids bow to each other as a symbol of humility. And then I had one child lay on the ground. And I said, you can't bow when you're laying on the ground. And I said, that's what pride events are all about is you got to stand up on your own two feet before you can be humble with each other. And so, but I think that a lot of churches get into trouble when they develop conceit or arrogance. 
and it ends up getting in the way of momentum and growth, right? So staying humble as an individual helps you to keep growing spiritually as a human being. But I think for churches too, as you grow, it's important not to think too highly of yourself. Does that make sense? So I kind of look at growth as inevitable if you're being faithful as a church. The first church I went into was a church that had rebuilt a building in the 1970s. So they were in this really tiny colonial building downtown with no parking. And they moved up to the top of the hill and built this big building with a big parking lot. And when I got there, they had conflict right after they moved into the new building. And so the general spirit was, this building's too big for us. Why are we here? One person said to me, I, I can't believe we have to heat this building every week. Um, it's too much. And I'm like, man, you guys are Yankees, huh? No. <laughs> but I walked in that room and all I saw was potential. And I'm like, this church is going to grow. It's inevitable. And that's kind of how I feel here, too. It's going to grow. It's inevitable. Because we have a big enough God. We have faithful enough people. And we have our priorities in the right place. I really think that we're on to something, so to speak. Um, and I think it's something that our society and world needs today. So it goes back to that initial comment. Any other questions? Yep, Kathy. I have a thought from when I was a teenager and a young adult that St. Mary was so much in church. We had a ladies' guild and a men's guild. And it was a great, it was just a great social group of ladies and they all became very good friends. Right. Yeah, there's, I could also see us doing like a men's breakfast as something that I've thought about. Um, I don't know why, but guys like food when we get together. <laughs> but no, I, I also think our small groups can be mixed gendered as well as solo gendered. Um, so there's all kinds of options that can exist in that regard too. Yep. Thanks, Kathy. Anyone else? The Booster Club? The, booster club? the Rooster Club. I think I heard of it. I, that was the men's group. Oh, maybe we should regain the rooster club. Yeah. Historically speaking, we used to have a Stephen Williams club. Yeah. A what? A Stephen Williams. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yep. I don't ha have a question. I just have sort of like a testimony that I got an email from a cousin who is retiring, and she said, I like retirement. I just have to figure out my purpose. Mm. And I thought to myself, that's not a problem I have. <laughs> and then when I looked at all the things that I do in my life, so much of it came out of this church. Yeah. Or is in this church. Like yes. started in the church or else it is part of the church. So I just felt like saying, well, hey, what you need is a church. <laughs> yeah. I think there's truth in that. And I've noticed through the years, I'm like, that people um, age well in churches. And I think there's two reasons. One is you have a sense of community with each other. And two is there's lots of purpose that you can participate in. And when people engage those things, those two things, you just age well. I don't know why. I just, just noticed it. Um, any other questions? Yes, Ted.
becomes a matter of just keeping the doors open and surviving. And there was an entire office in the, in the new UCC uh, um, 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 now that Masters is connected or not the United. There's one office just their job is closing churches. Because that's what's happening all over. And, uh, and I think it's important to note Ted and Dina are we're in our new members class this week, and so they're, it's going to become a we pretty quick. Um, <laughs> we, 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 we have been attending for the last five years. And, uh, we are very happy to, to, be joining, uh, to be joining this church because of all the things that you're doing and now that you're thinking about doing and, and, and basically growing and thriving as a church. And we would like to be part of that. <laughs> So one of the people who visited last Sunday was somebody who came from a UC church that closed and she said to me on the way out, I want to be a part of a place where I feel like there's going to be some stability. And that goes back to that as a focal point. But there's a fine line between surviving and thriving. And, and I think we're, we're in a situation where we can thrive. But I also don't look at it selfishly. My hope is we can also help other churches to thrive, and especially other churches in the UCC. Um, like I said, my first step into the UCC was through working with other churches, and I plan on continuing with that. I also hit a place in my work with UCC churches where I'm like, I think I'd be more effective or be able to do more if I was in a UCC church. I mean, that was part of the discernment, and I, and I think being here gives me even more hope that we can be, uh, have a positive influence on others. But that's where also staying humble and working with other churches because we think the whole thing matters, not us, you know? And that's where I think we have a, a lot to look forward to, so. Good. I'll close with a quick, quick prayer. Thanks for staying a little bit extra time today and uh, appreciate it. God, I thank you for this day. Thank you for the vision that you've put in our hearts and pray that you help it to continue to grow. Help us to look forward to the future together and to keep working on it one person and one day at a time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.